the Old Testament reading comes to us from the prophet Jonah, from the third chapter. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Jonah began to go to the city going a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. Then God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way. God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle, and also the uh, text for our message today, is from the seventh chapter of Paul's letter to the Corinthians, beginning at verse 29. This is what I mean, brothers and sisters. The appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no goods, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the Alleluia and the Gospel. of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brothers of Simon, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat mending the nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants, and they followed Jesus. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise you, O Christ. Now we make confession of our faith as expressed in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and 
was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead. His kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated for the singing of the hymn. Of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be 
be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. Amen. Grace and mercy and peace be unto, unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our dear redeemed in Christ, I want to share with you what happened about a week ago in Hawaii. This came over the cell phones of people who were in Hawaii. Ballistic missile threat inbound to Hawaii. Seek immediately immediate shelter. This is not a drill. So, this proved to be a mistaken message, but it took about 40 minutes for authorities to be able to correct this message. So you can imagine the terror that people were facing and experiencing who received this message. And so we realize that the time is short. Even though this proved to be a false message, yet for the people who first received it, it was a very scary thing. They thought their lives could be over right then and there. And so, we think about what it means that the time is short. That's what the Apostle relays to us in his letter to the Corinthians. And so, I've uh, used the theme, and I thought it would be appropriate for this weekend, is living the two-minute drill. Living the two-minute drill. And of course, we're going to refer to the football game. I'm not making predictions. That's not my job as a pastor. I don't have that inside kind of privilege. But there are some parallels that might help us here in living the two-minute drill. Uh, that's what the people in Hawaii experienced, right? In a very real way. You can bet that the coach of the Vikings as well as the coach of the Eagles, that they're going to practice the last two-minute drill. They're going to give that some attention because you know how it goes in a football game of 60 minutes. Sometimes it comes down to the last second or the last minute. As we experienced last Sunday, 30 seconds, right? when the Vikings got the ball back, <laughs> and uh, they knew that they had to get into field position in order to at least kick a field goal to try to win the game. And so that's how it often goes, but there is a parallel there in understanding that we are living in the two-minute drill. The apostle says the time is short. The time is short. So you can bet that these football players will be in tune to the two-minute drill. Now, we heard from the Old Testament prophet Jonah. We heard how he was given the instruction to go and proclaim to Nineveh the great city of the Assyrians. He didn't really want to go, and at first he went the other way. But finally, he did what the Lord commanded him. And what was his message? Forty days, and your, your lives are done with. Forty days, and God is going to judge you. The amazing thing is that the power of God's word could not be limited by Jonah's expectations or even his wishes, because we know he was somewhat angry with God's change of plan. But the power of God's word led these pagan people to repent and to do what Jonah had said. And so, yeah. 40 days 
Well, that's like living the two-minute drill, isn't it? There's only so much time. And we experience that when we read the Old Testament, and we see the many stories there. You remember how Lot had to make that quick escape from Sodom and Gomorrah? And Lot's wife, she had to, she looked back, didn't she? And she turned into a pillar of salt. Yeah, that last two minutes, that's, that's the important part, isn't it? As we realize in the football game, and most likely in the game today. You think about that. When you're watching the game today, you think about this message. It's going to follow you. You're not going to be able to shake it. Because it's living the two-minute drill. You know, Paul says some things here that are kind of puzzling. He talks in terms of these words. He says, those who mourn as though they were not mourning, those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, that may seem strange to us, but once again, I'm going to bring you to the football parallel. You know, last week, the Vikings were ecstatic. They were joyful. This was the miracle in Minneapolis, right? They were overjoyed. They were happy. And you can understand the emotion, right? But you know what? They're going to have to go into this game very sober-minded, very even keel. They can't really let the emotion of last week be the dominant thing. They've got to focus. They've got to focus on what they need to do. And so also that is true for you and I. Paul says, yes, rejoice as if you are not rejoicing. It seems a little strange to us, but I'm trying to give you a parallel understanding with something you are very familiar with in order to capture it. And so, the converse of that, you can't be um, too uh, down and out if you're on the losing end, right? I mean, that's the possibility that the Vikings could lose this game and not have the chance to celebrate the Super Bowl in their own stadium. But you know what? They can't really let that dominate their lives, right? Life goes on. The routine of being a, a parent and a husband and all of that, and a teammate, that's going to continue. So you can't let that bog you down, right? And so... We can understand how it might apply to those who were mourning as though they were not. Now, ultimately, we can understand this in terms of our life in Christ. That even though we find ourselves mourning, and one of our members gave me the name of a family whose wife and mother was killed in a car accident just recently. Even though our lives are involved in the grief and the mourning that this world brings, yet in another sense, we are not dominated by that. Because in Christ Jesus, the one who was delivered over for our offenses and raised again for our justification, he is the one who gives us victory and joy even in the midst of of death and defeat. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever lives and believes in me, even though he dies, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. You know, the Gospel tells us about how Jesus came to the shores of the Sea of Galilee and how he called his first disciples and how he called them to follow him. He said, repent and believe the gospel. Much like Jonah's message in former generations, 
But Jesus' message is the fulfillment and the consummation of all those prophets that went before. Repent and believe in the gospel. Yes, because the time is short. And yes, he will make them fishers of men. Repent and believe in the gospel. That's the message for you and I as well. Not only for the Ninevites who lived so long ago, but for you and I in this place, in this time. Jesus' message reaches to all of us because all of us have a sinful nature. All of us have that proclivity to do what, to go against what God has commanded. So repent. That means to have a change of mind. Just like the Ninevites changed their mind about how they were living and how they were doing things. You and I are called to repentance as well. You know, we have a tendency to give ourselves credit uh, for the successes, right, that we might have in our lives. But repentance is really changing our mind about all of that and, and giving the Lord the glory, right? Giving him the glory. I think about on a national scale, I think about this time of year, you know, Roe v. Wade anniversary, and you've got the handout. You think about repentance and how people kind of think it's their right to do what they want with an unborn child. People think that the blood <coughs> of an aborted child can cover their sin, sexual sin, perhaps. Really, it's only the blood of Christ that can cover the sin, whatever it might be. And so we understand how repentance and believing in the gospel, believing the good news, that Jesus' blood covers all of our sin. And we can heed the message of repentance with that hope. Rather than living in fear or denial, or guilt, or shame. But to believe the good news that Jesus forgives us all of our sin. You know, you think about, uh, you think about the Vikings last week. You think about uh, some of the testimony that we heard from the players. How the quarterback himself said that this is the third most exciting thing in my life. Number one was his relationship with his Savior. Number two was his relationship with his wife. The third most important was this football game and what just happened. But think about what that means. Think about the power of that. And think about it in the context of repentance and believing in the good news. Then we got maybe the uh, well, the uh, maybe hard to understand message that uh, we buy things as if we don't own them or keep them. That's kind of counterintuitive, isn't it? A little bit countercultural for people that kind of have a tendency to think that uh, you know the one with the most toys at the end wins. But we are in the world as Christians. We are not of the world. We are dealing with God's kingdom, which is far superior than our experience in the kingdom of the world. And so whatever we might buy or whatever we might need, we realize that it's not our ultimate need. It's not our ultimate possession that we will have to part with those things at some time. But it gives us a whole new perspective about stewardship and what it means to have the gifts from God and how we use our gifts. So we are strangers and aliens in this world. 
Yes. Our country, we have a better city and a better country. And Paul is very well aware of that. He himself said, I desire to depart and be with the Lord. But to live is Christ. That's a purpose. A real purpose that I have right now with my life. But to die will be gain. You know, Jesus told that parable about the uh, rich man who accumulated so much that he had to build bigger barns, right? In which to store it all. He thought that he could possess what he had acquired, right? In fact, he said to his soul, soul, take it easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But then Jesus tells that God comes to him in a dream and says, he addresses the man and says, your, tonight your soul will be required of you. The time is short, right? Then whose shall all these things be? Yeah. He bought and he purchased with the idea that he would hold on to those things. But Paul says it's not that way. We buy and possess as if we are not really engaged in the things of this world. That's a whole different perspective. And that's all part of the context of repentance, right? In that the time is short and God's kingdom is at hand. And living in this world is not the ultimate. But living in God's heaven is the ultimate. And so we set our things on, set our minds on things above, and not on things on this earth. So, living the two-minute drill. You're going to think about that, aren't you, when you watch football this afternoon? You think about that. It all comes down, usually, to the last minute, the last second. Paul's talking about something much bigger, much better. And he's talking about the crown of glory that will not fade away. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And now there awaits the crown of righteousness, which the righteous judge will give not only to me, but to all those who long for his appearing. God bless you as you uh, watch the game today, but God bless you as you live out the two-minute drill in your spiritual life. Amen. Amen. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever, world without end. Amen. And may the peace of God that surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen.